Okay, good evening to everybody. Uh, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, it's so nice to be back in the same room again uh, to just fellowship together under the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are thankful for this time. And actually, we are thankful for this day that all of us woke up today active, alert, and ready to do God's will. You know, many people, I think, as they slept through last night, uh, it was the last time that they were on earth and uh, our Heavenly Father called them back. And you know, while they have returned to glory, we are remaining. We are here, but we're going to learn today why we are here because we want to actually leave a legacy behind. And uh, we pray that as we share our lives and share our heart, that you will be blessed and it will also be a reminder to us on the things that God has done in our lives. So I'm just going to enable the screen share now. Okay. All right. Uh, is the screen share on? Can you all see? Clear? All right. Excellent. Okay. So this, this evening, we want to share with you about leaving a legacy. You know, we know that we are so grateful uh, to be blessed to live a life that is uh, full of favor with God and that God has given us gifts, talents. He has given us every ability and uh, his uh, will for us is to be the salt and light. We all know that. But today we want to share with you about how when we live our lives, we should not live it uh, as mundane things or things that are routinely done. But how can we live a life that it's a life of legacy that long after we are gone, people will be talking about us. Even when we are still around, people will be talking about us, not talking about us personally giving glory to us, but giving glory to the God who is in us because they are seeing something they've never seen before. They are seeing us as children of God do things which are mind-boggling, which are uh, difficult for them to understand. So how do we live that kind of a life? So uh, as we as we start, I think the first thing that we have to consider in our minds as we pursue uh, living a life of legacy is, uh, are we going to be mediocre or are we going to be excellent in our life? That is one of the battles that I think we go through every day in everything that we do from the minute, the smallest thing to the biggest thing. There's always a challenge whether we want to be excellent or whether we just want to be mediocre. Mediocre means we just and we just want to reach the halfway mark. Now, what are some of the differences uh, when it comes to mediocrity versus excellence? A mediocre person goes halfway up the mountain, and when the going gets tough, he throws in the towel and he and he takes a reverse gear and he goes back down. But you find someone who's excellent. He goes over the mountain, you know, he sees the mountain as a peak, that's something over the horizon. He rises above it, he achieves above everyone else. He, the standard that he sets is way above, it's high, it's high standards. It's not just meeting at halfway points, just doing the bare minimum where basic effort is needed, but it is where we give our maximum effort. We give 100%, not even 100%, but we give 110%, 120%. We pursue excellence in everything that we do. A person who is mediocre, who has a very minimal mindset, he's just happy to do the minimal. I will just do what is necessary so that I, uh, I can pass. I can just get through. Uh, I don't have to strive for excellence. It's just something to help me get through. I'm willing to do the bare minimum. People who do the bare minimum, they don't tend to go very far in life because they're not willing to give more than what we have. They're not willing to concentrate, put effort into what they are doing. But a person who is excellent, who has that mindset of excellence, 
has a desire for greatness. The question is always, what can I do better? How can I improve my efficiency? How can I do things that would uh, save me time? How do I do things that will maximize the rewards I receive? A person who is excellent is always asking questions of improvement. Someone who is mediocre is very comfortable being in his comfort zone because he is not pushed in any way. I'm just happy being where I am. Mediocrity is fine. But then you find someone who is excellent, who is pursuing excellence, always rises up to a challenge. Challenges are what makes a person excellent because you're always setting the benchmark, you're pushing it higher and higher. You want to achieve more in lesser time. You've got a mindset of constantly improving things. And this kind of a person likes a challenge. A challenge is seen as something that can build me, you know, I'll, I'll do it, just do it, like as Nike says. But a person who is mediocre, as soon as a challenge is thrown, uh, the person would just fall back and say, no, this is too much effort. And also, we have these, this battle that uh, often goes into our minds, even in the smallest things that we do. A mediocre person is often stagnant in life, but when you compare it to someone who is excellent, that person is always looking to soar like an eagle, you know, and a person who has the mindset of excellence. Uh, what helps us is Colossians 3.23. When we read God's word, it says in Colossians 3.23, uh, let me get it for you. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. You know, in everything that we do, if we have this mentality that Paul writes about, that we are serving God, that should be the impetus to help us do our best, not just in the spiritual things, but, you know, in the practical things, in the daily things, because whatever we do it, we are doing it as if we are doing doing it to God. And, you know, when we, for us who really love Jesus and who have a personal relationship with him, our mindset is one of everything I do, I do it for God's glory. I've got no hidden agenda. I've got no personal agenda in my life. But when you compare it to Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4, Proverbs tells us the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. If we are mediocre, Proverbs tells us you will get nothing out of life because mediocre is like everybody. Everybody just wants to do the bare minimum. They don't want to push on. But when you are a diligent person, you reap the rewards that are there. You will see uh, the fruits of your labor. Reward always goes, um, let's say, reward is all, uh, your effort is always rewarded. I remember uh, in my early days, you know, when the Lord called, uh, called us into uh, teaching, I used to teach music. Uh, I used to love music and because I love music, I gave I gave it the best of my ability. Everything I did, I made sure that uh, I was like the cream of the crop. Among all the teachers in the uh, association that we were teaching, I would always give my best to make sure that uh, my students are always the ones that are talked about. Uh, my students are the ones who are excellent. And you know, I didn't do it for any reward. I did it because I wanted my best. I wanted to give my best. And I know in giving my best, I would give glory to God because people knew that we were Christians. So when they look at a Christian, they must see excellence. They mustn't see mediocrity. And, it, and I remember at one of the, uh, in my early years of teaching, uh, as I was just into the association, <clears throat> uh, it was the uh, Trinity uh, Music School, you know, the, the head of the head colleges, of course, in UK. So I used to teach under Trinity and um, they came, uh, they always have yearly awards that are given out to students for the high achievers. And you know, I went for one of it and just a few days prior to it, the director here called me and said, you know, uh, 
we, we noticed that your students are the cream of the crop. They're always doing very well. Would you mind getting one of your students to come and do a performance during the graduation? And I was like, I was like blown away at the time because, you know, there were many others who were graduating with uh, honors and, you know, with a good grades. And uh, it, was, it was given to me and said, would you like to put one of your students? So, of course, I jumped at the opportunity. I said yes before thinking who could go in. And after, and after thinking about it, I, I thought to myself, everybody expects uh, adults to go and perform. But I decided I want to show them something different. So I, I got one of my younger students. He was just seven years old at the time. And he was just uh, learning the keyboard for about uh, just about a year. And he was the youngest there. And I got him to do a performance. And you should have seen the whole hall. Uh, he was playing the keyboards. And you know, this small a little young boy, he's probably uh, really small. You can imagine how some, uh, someone who's seven years old looks like, you know, walking up the stage with a bow tie on him. And he went and did a performance. And he actually got a standing ovation. And after that, everybody came and they were congratulating him. And of course, he was like, oh, who's your teacher? Who is your teacher? And I was just in the background. I was just telling him, you go, you go and get all the glory. You went up there and performed. You know, for me, it was giving excellence, being excellent. Why? Because we want to leave a mark. We want people to know that we are not going to settle for anything less, you know. And... Uh, when you when you talk about leaving a legacy, uh, I want to quickly touch about uh, what is the armor that we wear? What is the mindset that we have? Now, the mindset of someone who is just mediocre, someone who doesn't, doesn't want to leave a legacy is this. He says to himself, I will just go with the flow and blend in with what everyone else is doing. If someone else tells me it is a good method, then I would just accept that as gospel truth. This is, if somebody tells me, I would just go with it. I would not take the time to research it, to check it, to make sure that that is indeed a good method. But when you compare it to someone who has a mindset of excellence, someone who has God in his life, this should be our answer. I prefer to go with what God says will give me the best results. Rather than listening to others, I would take my time to discern the situation and ask God to direct me. When we put God first, God causes us to always look beyond what is apparent to the human eye. We all know that. I'm sure all of us have experienced that uh, at different points in our life, at different stages in our life. And Paul tells us very beautifully in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 2, he talks about the renewing of the mind, be transformed. If you think differently, the, what you think is what you will become. And he says, be transformed to the renewal of your mind. Our mind constantly needs to be in renewal, especially in these days that we live in when we're looking at the media, when we're getting so, we are flooded with information all around, we must have a filter or we must always check information based on what is God saying. Whatever we see, even in the media, it should always be, God, what are you saying? It's not what the media is saying. It's not what people in front of me are saying, but what are you saying? Because men sees things as how they see it. They, they uh, let's say they fashion us to think in a particular way to follow their whims and fancies. But if we look at God and we and through a renewed mind, God is able to cause us to see beyond. He's able to take us to see behind the schemes of men so that we will actually know what is the best, what is the truth. And uh, I believe that right now, the age that we are living at, uh, the enemy is working over time. Okay? Just a couple of days ago, I just, uh, I just remember this Bible verse uh, in Luke. You know, after Jesus was tempted, uh, it's, it says in Luke, after Jesus was tempted, the devil left him until a more opportune time. The devil left him until a more opportune time. 
And I was, as I was just thinking through the Gospels, after that occasion, I don't remember any point where Satan came to tempt Jesus again. But that caused me to think because when, when the devil met Jesus in the wilderness, he knew he had met more than his match because Jesus defeated him. And for him to come around a second time, he knew he would get the same treatment. So he was not going to be victorious. To me, the opportune time that the devil chose was throughout Jesus's ministry because the devil could not attack or tempt Jesus directly. He used the scribes, he used the Pharisees, he used all the naysayers around Jesus to get to Jesus. But as we know, they did not succeed. Now the same, I believe, uh, is in our life. There may be seasons when we overcame temptations and we feel that, you know, okay, the, the devil is not on my back now, things are clear. But little, uh, little do we know, maybe the devil is trying to work through different people. He can't get to us directly. One of the ways that he could get to us is by planting thoughts through people. Why do extra? Why be the best? You know, just, just do what is necessary. Why do you want to go the extra mile? We may have voices like this that come our way and that would actually derail us. It would take us away from creating a legacy. The devil is the one person who does not want us to leave a legacy. But we are better than that because we know that if we live a life according to the gospel, we have to live a life of legacy. So we must not allow the enemy to get to us through anybody else. That's why we need to have God's armor on with us. And to just look at a little bit about God's armor, I want us to just look at this portion in scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. This is the story about David and Goliath. Okay. Now, when we look at this entire story, I'd like you to go to chapter 17 and verse 40. I'm going to read it for you. Now, in verse 40, it says, talking about David, then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag <clears throat> in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand. Now let's look at the tools that David had when he went for this battle against Goliath. You know, when he went to meet Goliath, when he got up that morning, he did not know he was going to meet Goliath. He did not know the battle that was ahead of him. He did not know what was going to happen. So he just went with his shepherd's bag. Now, if we see, it says that he took, he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he, which he had, and his sling. Now, this is a picture of the sling. It's a slingshot. Okay? It's called a catapult. Okay. Now, in Malaysia, uh, we call this elastic. Okay. It's actually from the root word elastic because the band that is attached uh, to the Y piece of wood, the Y shaped piece of wood, is an elastic band. So, in Malaysia, in the Malaysian language, Bahasa Malaysia, it's called uh, lastic, L-A-S-T-I-K. So we used to call this lastic. And when I saw this picture, uh, it reminded me of the days when I was growing up, you know, <clears throat> we used to use this lastic. That time we didn't, I didn't know about David and Goliath, but I used to use the lastic, uh, put stones to it, or, you know, uh, uh, wrap up bundles of paper, tie it up until it's thick, put it on the lastic and aim and shoot at birds. That was what we used to do. Shoot at birds being the naughty boys that we were, and sometimes when we were at school, because our school was next to uh, the girls' school, so we used to use the elastic and hit, uh, hit the girls. Okay, that's the naughty me that was coming out. <laughs> that was before Pastor Justin came into the picture. <laughs> so that's the elastic that he had. Okay, and the Bible also tells us he took his staff in his hand. Now, why did he take his staff in his hand? No doubt everywhere that he went, <clears throat> David took his staff along. But on this day, unbeknown to him, the staff would be something that would leave a mark. Uh, the staff would be something that he would need to see. Now, if you look <clears throat> at the staff, okay, for a shepherd, a shepherd boy, as he sits in the field, 
uh, taking care of the sheep, it, the staff is there to protect. Yes, it's there to pull the sheep back when the sheep, sheep tends to wander. But the other times when the sheep <clears throat> is lying around, lazing around, what does the shepherd boy do? He takes his staff and he carves on it. You know, it's like nowadays we doodle. We've got a pen and paper and we doodle, we draw things, you know. And now I think they've even got apps where you can doodle on your phone, okay? Now, if I were to doodle, I don't know what would come out because I don't have the artistic flair in me, okay? Uh, my art, my, the artistic nature in me only comes out in music, nothing else. So what, the, what did David do? He began to carve things on his staff. What did he carve? He carved all his victories, the pivotal moments of his life when he fought against the lion and he succeeded. At night, as he was sitting down, he would have carved, reliving the story, he would have made a carving on his rod. When he overcame the bear, the same night, the day after, as he was reflecting on it, he would have carved it. That was his trophy. And when the shepherds met on the field, what would they do? They would look at each other's staff and they would ask him, what is this picture? What does that show? And David would have used it to tell them of his victories over the paw of the lion and the bear. That was the reminder to him as they were sitting down, as they were talking. It was a central point of conversation when they were meeting together. Now, on the day that he was about to go to Goliath, as he was standing there, he had his staff in his hand. And you know, as he was standing and looking at the situation, he would have looked at the staff that he was holding, you know, and he would have looked at it with his eye, looked at all the carvings that he had, all the victories that he had. And as he was looking at it, the fear that was probably there or the questions that were maybe silent in his mind, one by one begin to dissolve because in his staff, he saw the victories that God gave to him. And that's where the boldness arose from David. And he could say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is talking against this God of mine? This God who delivered me from all of my victories. Who are you to downplay my God? Something rose up from him. So the, the shepherd's staff was something that was so important for David. When we leave our legacy, what is our shepherd's staff in our hand? Okay. Now to get into that, I'm going to ask my wife to take over. She's going to tell you about that. How can you have that shepherd's staff and what is it in our lives today that we can all strive for excellence and leave a legacy? Okay, so when we look at it, we see that David, as the shepherd, that was his sort of like his free time, that is what he used to do. He used to actually take his staff, take a sharp object, and he would just start carving on it. And every time he carved, he carved out every victory, every miracle, every breakthrough that happened. That is the reason he had the staff in his hand. Now, I'm not sure if you know it, whether you've heard of this, it's called a totem pole. Now, what is a totem pole? It is actually something that exists in New Zealand, all right? Now, when you look at it, of course, it looks a bit like it's like got witchcraft or some kind of voodoo kind of effects on it. But if you look at the origin of the totem pole, it actually originates very much similar to what David did when he was carving it. Now, in certain tribal areas, tribal groups in New Zealand, every house that you go to, if you see this picture on the left, you see a house in the background and all along the outside of the landing or all that, you see all these totem poles. And a close-up of the totem pole will show you separate carvings, individual carvings that are done. And if you read the history of totem poles, every family has their own totem pole. For generations to generations, every miracle, every great thing that God did, every breakthrough 
they would state and they would start carving it on the totem pole. So when people come to the house, the first thing that they would look at is they would look at the totem pole. And when they look at a particular design on it and they're curious, they will ask, so what is this design? How come I see this picture that is here that is carved? What's the story behind it? And the head of the family now has an opportunity to testify and to share on what was that event that happened? What was the miracle that happened at that time that caused us to carve that on the totem pole? Nowadays, when we look at it, it looks a bit like it's into witchcraft, but actually the origin of it, the totem pole, it derives from the, the native word ododem, which means his kingship group. Every family was had one. It was not an object of worship. It was not something that was used in rituals or any witchcraft or anything. It was just a way in which they could document and remember every victory, every breakthrough that God did in their family. And these totem poles would be there from generation to generation, from great grandfather to grandfather to father to son. Everybody would know every carving and the story or the testimony that is behind it. So when you look at things like that, if you look at David and he started to carve things and the totem pole for the New Zealand people, they do that. In our lives, of course, we are not going to walk around with the staff. I'm sure none of us want to go and get one, go and get a whole big, huge totem pole and plant it right in front of our yard and put it there. And then people will think like, oh, I don't know what kind of false teaching, wrong doctrines, false prophets these people are. You don't need to get that particular object. But in your life, are you remembering every miracle God has done? Are you documenting all this to pass it on to your next generation, to your children, to your grandchildren, that you can leave a legacy that they can just take it, they can run with it, and they can just move forward. Let's look back. What we want to challenge you all today is look back at your lives and see after all these years that have led your lives, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, however long you have been here, have you done anything to leave a legacy that people will remember you for this great thing that you have done for God's glory? Not just that people will remember your name, your identity. You don't want just the popularity or the fame. But what are you doing to leave a legacy that people can say, wow, this is truly the God that he worships. This is what that the person has done that I just want to know who this God is. What is your totem pole? What are the things that you are living that 10, 15 years down the line, people will still remember you and people will know you did this because of the God that you serve? I'd like to share with you. Okay, sorry. This one is on the totem pole. It, the ones that were in New Zealand, it was a clan lineage. That means every clan or every family through the generations, it was planted there. It was a reminder to them. It was a mark of pride because every family would have one. Imagine you go to somebody's house. The minute you walk in, the first thing that you're going to see is this totem pole. So it becomes a piece. It becomes an object of conversation. We can stand there and we can look at the pole and we can look at all the angles and all the carvings and we can talk about all the victories that's been present from generation to generation. And imagine every child after that, every generation, everybody's just going to keep carving and carving. So they remember things of their parents, of their grandparents, of their great-grandparents. Everything is remembered. We can't have a totem pole now. But can we stop for a moment and ask ourselves, what have we received from our grandparents? certain characteristics, certain gifts, certain talents from our parents. What is it that we have in us because of them? And what can we do to pass it on to the next generation? It may be your children. It may be youths in your church. It may be the people God has put within your ministry. But what are you pouring in them that leaves a legacy? I'd like to share with you two things. 
One, what was my husband's totem pole? What was the legacy that he received and he passed on? And then I will tell you mine. For my husband, his grandfather was a good violinist. His grandfather loved to play the violin. And every time he had free time, he would just pick up that violin and he would just play it. So his grandfather had a lot of music in him. But his children, he had five children, none of them really had that music bug or anything that was just flowing in his blood. But somehow when my husband was born, on his sixth birthday, all right, what happened was his grandfather bought him the snare drum. And my husband deliberately put this photo here because he said, I remember I was six years old and the snare drum that my grandfather bought for me was blue in color. Exactly like this. He actually went on Google, he found this photo and he said, I need to put this in the slide because that's exactly how my drum looked like. His grandfather bought him the snare drum and just gave it to him as a birthday present. What inspired him to do it, I don't know. Nobody ever bought him any instruments, but when his grandfather bought this for him, my husband said he picked up those sticks and he just started playing. And he said his grandfather realized this little boy, he knows tempo, he knows a drum beat, he knows rhythm, he knows timing, everything. My husband just knew it at the age of six, with six without anyone teaching him. He just picked up those drumsticks and he just started playing the drums like as if he was a little drummer boy. And his grandfather was so amazed. He's like, you're six years old. You don't know anything about music. How do you know drum beats? How do you know tempos? How do you know rhythms? How do you know how to control the beat? And what his grandfather said was, you know, kids, when they're young, you give them a toy, they would probably get excited with it for about four to five days. And then they lose interest once they find another toy. But apparently that's not what happened with my husband. He started on that drum and he refused to stop. Every day he said he tied it around his neck and just walked around the house like that Christmas little drummer boy and he was just playing that drum. Anyone else came and gave him any toys. It didn't interest him at all. He just pushed aside every other toy and just got excited on this drum. And my, his grandfather was so excited. It's like, wow, that music that is in me is finally now in my grandson. He was so excited. His parents realized, my husband's parents realized that. And when he was 12 years old, when they were financially stable enough, signed him up for music classes. And that's how my husband started to learn the keyboard. And that is how from learning the keyboard, becoming a keyboardist in church, heading the worship ministry, teaching music full time, and what he shared about all his students was the lineage or the legacy from his grandfather that was passed down to him. And to value that and to see, wow, this is something that my grandfather gave me. I want to use it for God's glory. I want to do something great with this. It's not like he went to a pub and started playing just to earn money or anything. It was a gift from God. And my husband just decided if music is this gift from God, I'm just going to use it for God's glory. It's going to be to worship God. There are many things in us, God has put it in us because of our parents or grandparents. Let's take it do something with it and decide what is the legacy that I want to live, that at the end of it, people are going to glorify God and not glorify self. I'll share with you now about my totem pole, all right? Surprisingly, when we were talking about it, we realized that both of us, it happened at the age of six, all right? For me, what happened at the age of six was it came to Christmas and every year when it comes to Christmas, my parents would ask us, what do you want for Christmas? And we'd get excited and we'd say, oh, we want this, we want that. So there's only my sister and me. So when my parents asked my sister what she wanted, she immediately said, I want a Monopoly set. At that time, you know, that board game Monopoly was like very famous and she was like so much into board games. She instantly said, I want a Monopoly set. Then my dad and mom turned to me, six years old, and asked me, Jackie girl, what do you want for Christmas? 
And I just looked at them so excited and I said, I want a blackboard. And my parents looked at me and went, a what? I want a blackboard and I want chalk. Of course, at that time, we didn't have whiteboards and marker pens. And I was so excited. I said, I want chalks of all colors and I want a duster or eraser, but I want a blackboard. And my parents looked at me and said, you don't want a doll? And I went, no. Nope. You don't want a teddy bear, Jackie girl? Do you want a teddy bear? And I said, no, nope. I want a blackboard. And my parents were shocked and they looked at me and they said, why do you want a blackboard? Which six-year-old kid wants a blackboard? And I actually looked at them. My parents told me this had happened and they said, you looked at us with such confidence. Like, why are you so confused? I looked at them with great confidence and I said, that's because when I grow up, I'm going to be a teacher. So I need my blackboard to practice. And my parents were like so shocked and said like, what makes you think you're going to be a teacher? I know, I know I'm going to be a teacher when I grow up. So I need to start practicing from now. I need my blackboard. And would you believe it that Christmas, my parents were searching high and low in every shop, every store they could find. They found the blackboard. They found a box. I remember I had a box with multicolored chalks. Wow, I had red, blue, green, yellow, white, everything. I had all those colors. I had a duster. Everything was wrapped up and kept under the tree. Christmas morning when I woke up and I saw my board, oh, I was like the happiest person on planet Earth. I was so excited. I didn't care about anything else that was happening that Christmas. I just ran to the storeroom, took out a hammer and nail, gave it to my dad and said, knock that nail and hang up that board. My school starts today. <laughs> and that was 25th December. And my parents looked at me and goes, where are your students? So guess what? These were all my students. <laughs> Every teddy bear, every doll that I had, I carried all the chairs from the house, lined it all up outside in the porch. I did it all on my own. I carried every chair, put it out, carried every teddy bear and doll, laid it on those chairs, set them all up in front of the board, and I started teaching. Every day I would go to kindergarten, my teacher would teach us our ABC and I'd come back and I'd teach all my teddy bears A, B, C. Everything that I was taught in school, if I learned one plus one is two, I would run back home, set up all the chairs, bring out all my teddy bears and I would just start teaching. I just loved it so much. Why? Because my dad had it in him. It was in his blood to educate, to teach, to pour into people, to inspire into people. And that automatically came into my blood. After teaching for about a few months, my mom reminded me on this uh, many years ago. She said, do you know one day you woke up and you came and asked me for a red pen? And I looked at you and go, what? Yeah, I need a red pen. I was only about seven or eight. And my mom again asked me, why do you need a red pen? Because teachers need to mark books. And for a teacher to mark a book, they need red pen. So get me a red pen. So my mom actually went and bought me a red pen. Of course, I didn't have any books to mark. So she took all the old school books, recycled papers. She stapled it into books. There was all sorts of things written on it that I couldn't even read but I would actually sit at a table with a red pen and I would mark. I could hardly read even 1% of what I was marking, but I could happily go with the red pen and I would mark it and mark it and I put 100%, you get a star, you get an A, you get a well done. I just got excited doing that. And for those of you who don't know, the minute I graduated from college, my first day of working was as a teacher. I started lecturing in college and I was teaching business. I taught for 19 years until 2014 when we stepped into full-time ministry. Even that God told us, I know your dream. I know you love teaching so much. So you can give up lecturing, you can give up teaching business and marketing 
but you're still going to continue to teach. But now you're going to be teaching the word of God. That is why I get so excited. Even when we go for mission trips, it can be deep in a village. One month before, my husband will be messaging the pastor in that country and say, you know, we're going to be teaching. Uh, my wife is the kind of person that needs a board. She can't just stand there and stand still with her hands like that. She can't. She will just get into a fix or something. She needs a board. And I tell you, pastors will go looking for blackboard. They'll go for whiteboard. Um, there were countries we went, they didn't have boards. And we said, never mind, it's okay, we'll just go with paper. We'll just put a big, huge sheet of white paper or a manila card there and I would just write on it because it's just in me. All of us, if you look at your lives, there are characteristics, there are traits in you, natural things that you are born with because you got it from your dad, you got it from your mom, your parents look at you, your brothers and sisters look at you and they say, you know, you have that gift. You're just like your uncle. Do you know your grandfather used to do that? Do you know your grandmother used to be so good at this and that is why you're so good at it? Why did God give it to you? Why did he put that talent in you? If it is music, if it is dancing, if it is talking. I know uh, last week, I think when, I, when we shared, we said about, because I, I love to talk to all my teddy bears so much is when my parents joked and said that I came out mouth first because the minute I was born, I started talking. And until every day, you know, I, I am just a person, I just love to talk, okay? I don't ask me why. My husband just, uh, the other day, I, I, we went to sleep at night and my husband looked at me and goes, don't you ever get tired of talking? And I go, no, I don't. <laughs> then, then I suddenly became like very holy and I told him, I tell you what, tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk less. And I tell you, my husband laughed so loud. I think the whole neighborhood heard it. And he says, please, that won't work. I said, yes, yes. Tomorrow morning, I am going to talk less. Watch and see, I can do it. I woke up in the morning. I forgot. I was still yakking the whole day. He kept silent. He was so patient with me. He kept silent. And when it came to night, about 10 something, he reminded me, didn't you say you were going to talk less? And I went, oh, I forgot. <laughs> I can't help it. And my husband said, yes, I know. You can't help it because when your mouth opens, it just doesn't stop. But that's just in me. I just love to talk. I love to inspire people so much. What we want to ask you today is, what is your totem pole? In your family, in your life, from the time you were young, people saw certain gifts in you. Something that is so unique. Your brother doesn't have it. Your sister doesn't have it. Your cousins don't have it, but it just stands out in you. What is that lineage? What is that symbol? What is that mark that God has put on you? And as you ask yourself that question, now take that and tell God, Lord, if you have put this trait in me, like for my husband, it was music. For me, it was teaching and inspiring people. If God has put it in you, how can you take that now? Use it for God's glory and say, Lord, at the end of the day, we want people to glorify you. If they see this gift in me, let me use it for ministry. Let me use it to touch the lives of people. Let me use it that I can inspire somebody else that they would also wake up and see, I got this from my grandfather. I got this from my uncle. I got this from my auntie. My dad loves to educate. He loves to teach and inspire people. My dad's brother was a teacher. And I used to admire him like anything ever since I was a kid. Every time during the holidays, when we go to my uncle's house, he stays in another state about four hours away. And during the school holidays, we would go there. And when we stay there, I get so excited because he's a teacher. And I would love to go to his room, look at his books. And I remember once um, he was driving out of the house and I, he asked, I asked him, uncle, where are you going? And he, it was in December, school holidays. And he said, oh, I'm going to school to pick up some exam papers. The minute I heard school, I got so excited and I said, please, please, please let me get into the car with you. And my uncle said, no, I'm going to school 
and I'm going to the staff room to pick up papers. No, you can't come. And I just, please, I just begged him and I jumped into the car and I begged him, please take me and go. When he reached the school, he parked the car and he said, stay in the car. Don't come out. And he walked towards the staff room. Of course, disobedient me didn't want to listen. I opened and I stuck behind him. Why? Because I wanted to see a school staff room. I was about seven or eight years old because in my head, I knew someday I'll be a teacher and I would be working in such a place. So I want to see it for myself. I actually followed behind him quietly, stood at the door of the school staff room just to peek inside and go like, wow. And I tell you, heaven came down and glory filled my soul and all the angels, the choirs of angels were singing. Because for me, that was like the best place ever. What moves you? What is the gift that God has given you? You know you have it. You've had it for 30 years, for 40 years. Your wife tells you, your husband tells you, you are so good in this. It's God's way of telling you, leave, take this and leave a legacy. It is never, ever too late. You don't have to be 20 years old. You don't have to be 15 years old to leave a legacy. Some of you, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. The decision to start today and say, I want to do something with what God has given me and I want to leave a legacy that shows this God in me that is so powerful that can touch and change the lives of others. What defines you? For my husband, before we stepped into missions, what defined him was music. That's it. He always says, you know, if I, if I go to a hospital and I'm giving blood uh, donation, blood donation, and they just draw out the blood, music notes will just come out because it is just in him. For me, if you go for a blood donation drive and they draw out the blood from me, I always tell them mathematic formulas will come out. Sine, cosine, tangent, phy uh, th uh, theorem, Pythagoras, everything would just come out because I just love that so much. But what defines you and what have you done about it? How can you take what is already in you? You don't have to force it out. You don't have to struggle for it because God created you with something great. If you can take that and tell God, Lord, even after I have gone 20, 30 years down the line, Lord, People will still remember this thing that I left behind, this thing that I did. And they will not admire me, but they will glorify God and it would inspire them to also do the same. You leave a legacy not for people to admire you, not for people to elevate you and put you on a pedestal. You leave a legacy that they know the God that is in you and you leave a legacy because it will inspire someone else, another 13 or 14 year old boy to look at you and say, wow, if he served God and he could do that, God, what can you do with me? How can you use me, Lord, that I can inspire people? That is what we want to encourage you with today. Leave a legacy. Do something great. That means don't just take every day for granted and just live every day like it's just 24 hours, 24 hours and just let every day go by. Because none of us know how long we're going to live. None of us know that we're going to live till we're 80 or 85. We never know when God is going to call us back. But what we need to do is to tell God, Lord, every moment, I want to give my best for you and I want to leave something behind. I'm sure you know the testimony about my husband and I before we met because I like to teach and I like to write a lot. I used to write a lot of um, songs. I used to write a lot of poems and my prayer during my teenage years was, God, when I grow up and I fall in love, I want somebody who loves music, okay? That was my only criteria. You love God, you want to serve God, and you must love music. The only reason is because I had all those poems and I wanted it to become worship songs. And God heard that prayer. He sent me somebody who loved God, who wanted to serve God, and who had that music in him. And it was only when we got married 
as you know, we recorded our worship album. And in this album, the title of the album was called One Voice. And there are 10 songs on that album. And we're just going to worship God through one of that songs now. The song that we're going to worship God through now, the title of the song is actually Lord, Not My Will. Majority of the songs, um, I write the lyrics and then my husband puts the music in. But this song, while my husband was in church, we we're just sitting in church listening to a sermon and God just started to download all the lyrics in him. And he was sitting next to me and he was just scribbling on a paper and I'm like, is the pastor speaking that many notes? He's like hardly speaking anything and you're writing so much. He just quoted one verse, you're writing like five pages. I got a song, I got a song. You're not the only one who can write songs, you know. I can write songs too. I was like so shocked. Wow, you're writing a song. That's a miracle in itself. After the service, he showed it to me and he says, this is the lyrics. And I go, lyrics for what? It's one of the songs that's going to be on an, in the album. And it's entitled, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I was like, wow. And he was, I was so honest. Going, Why? Because he had a verse, he had the chorus, he had the bridge, everything there in just like three minutes, he had the whole song. And I really thank and praise God because remember the violin that was in his grandfather that came down to him and all that music that was in him. When we wanted to record our album, we didn't have the finances to hire all the musicians. We didn't have money to get a drummer, a bassist, a guitarist, uh, someone to play the saxophone, someone to play the trumpet. We couldn't afford all that. We could only afford each other, all right? And the producer in the studio told us, you have to pay by the hour. How many hours you sit in the studio, you have to pay. And it was coming up to a lot. So we prayed and we told God, Lord, what are we going to do? Then I looked at my husband. I said, well, you're the one with all the music in you. I just write the songs. You tell us what we need to do. And he said, let's invest in a workstation. Of course, I didn't know what a workstation was. It looks exactly like a keyboard, but it's called a workstation because you can play every instrument on it. And for all the songs on the worship album, if you hear it, it sounds like there's an orchestra. It sounds like there's a bassist standing there. But it was actually my husband on the workstation playing the sound of the basses. He played the basses, he played the guitar, he played the trumpet, he played the saxophone, he played the cymbals, he played the tambourine. If there were 15 instruments, he played every single instrument, took it to the studio, and then they combined everything together. And it sounds like, wow, we had a whole band with us. But actually, the band was only my husband. And we really, truly thank and praise God because for us, our lineage is if God has gifted us with this talent, this is what we want to leave behind. And we want to encourage you, even as we move into the song, and you ask God, Lord, what is your will for my life? What is that mark that you have put on me? You have stamped it on me. The day you were formed in your mother's womb, God already put that mark on you and said, Fiona, I created you for this. This is the legacy that I want you, I want you to leave behind. Every one of you, Sawai, this is the mark that I put on you. Pastor Simon, Anita, Caroline, Mary, all of you, Brother Vijay, all of you, this is the mark God has already put on you. And he's asking you today, 20 years have gone, 30 years have gone, some of you 60, 70 years have gone, have you left a legacy? Have you done something with that mark that even years later, people will still glorify God and be inspired to do something? I pray even as we worship God through this song right now, that you would just ask God, Lord, what is your will for my life? The wordings of the song says, I yield my life, Lord. I just surrender my life according to your word, according to what you want to do. Show me what is in me that I can bring it out. Lord Jesus, even as we worship you through this song, oh Father, we pray, Lord, that as we listen to the words of this song, that you would just show us, Lord, 
every mark that is already carved on us. The totem pole is already there inside us, Lord. You've already carved it. Begin to just show it to us, Father, that we can make a decision today to leave a legacy. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. The will of God will never take you to where the grace of God will not protect you. Psalm 143 says, Teach me, Lord, to do your will. Show me the way that I should go. Yeah.
live my life according to your holy will. Fashion my heart, Lord, that like David, I may have a heart after yours. I surrender to your voice that your plans and purposes will be accomplished in me. Speak to me, Lord, that I may know your ways. Reveal yourself to me, that I may know you more. Cause me to prevail over life's circumstances and not be drawn into it, that I may rise up to be what you want me to be. Jesus, we just commit every person to you right now, Father, that you would just begin to speak in their spirit, Father. Show us everything that you have already imprinted in them, Lord Jesus, from the day they were born. And Lord, I pray today they would take it, they would run with it, oh God, to give you all glory, and they would leave a legacy, Lord Jesus, that people will not just look at us, but they will look at the God that we serve, that it would inspire them, Lord Jesus, to also take what they have and to run with it, O oh God. Lord, I just commit, Father, every person right now, Lord Jesus, everyone here, Lord, that you would just speak into their spirits, O oh God, begin to move them, begin to inspire them, Lord Jesus, to leave a legacy for your glory that people will know them and people will remember them, Father, because of the God that we serve. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 amen.